The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. Our speaker is Jim Mitchell, who will share stories about his work in protecting the region's fish and wildlife. Jim is a retired Alberta Fish and Wildlife Officer, or Game Warden. Jim retired in 2019 after 38 plus years of dedicated service for the Alberta government. After retiring, he worked at the Lethbridge College, instructing conservation enforcement classes. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, have been asked to uh, come and talk to you today. Uh, special thanks to uh, Gord for the introduction and, and Christy and Sakpa for coming and uh, Knut for getting everything ready with the computer today. Um, my, my talk today is going to be a little bit about what my job is and, um, and a little bit about a couple stories that I've uh, written in a book that I uh, published earlier on this year. Um, what, can, what can we learn from wildlife and what can it teach us? Um, like I said, like uh, Gord said, um, we, we traveled to Scotland recently and uh, during that time we wanted to uh, check to uh, just see some family heritage about what was going on and uh, from there we, we really understood um, what was happening and, uh, um, and, and I, I just got one slide that I have to do here. And with it, um, uh, like I said, two weeks ago, and we went to um, honor my dad's uh, 50th anniversary of his passing. Um, we had, we, both my grandparents, uh, actually three out of the four of my grandparents, were uh, immigrated from Scotland and came here. And um, we wanted to go and, uh, and honor that. Uh, with that, um, um, my dad, uh, it's, it's emotional for me still, as my dad was my mentor. He died when I was 14 years old, and uh, he instilled the love of fish and wildlife uh, into me with taking me hunting and fishing till his passing. After he passed, I'd made the decision that I wanted to become somebody that would protect the resource and save the resource for people that came after us, our, our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids. In 1979, after graduating high school, I applied to Lethbridge College here. And it's, it's kind of funny because I was born in Lethbridge for six months. I come back to Lethbridge for two years and then I uh, retired in Lethbridge at the end of my career. Uh, when I first got when I first got accepted at the college, we needed to get some experience, and I went up to the uh, Northwest ter Territories, where um, I became a fishing guide for the summer in between semesters. That's kind of a funny picture there, because our first day out, we got into a bay about 80 kilometers from our, uh, our lodge, and the ice flow changed and blocked us into the into the bay. So. This is a picture of us uh, pushing the boat over a mile over ice with some American clients till we hit uh, open water. So I think that was the first time that I'd had some experience with some, with some ice. Like Gord said, uh, my career started in 1981. I was uh, hired in Barhead. I had uh, transferred after two years to Red Deer, and during that time, you would get a phone call in the middle of the night or six o'clock in the morning in this case, saying that you were transferred to a location that you never knew where you were going. In this case, I got a phone call saying that I was transferred to uh, Red Deer. We spent uh, two years there, and uh, I promoted to a district officer in High River, where I spent 13 years and with my wife, Joanne, who's here. And uh, both our kids were born in, uh, in High River. 
1998, I wanted a different experience, so I opened up a new district in Sundry, which was more remote, and, and you'll see quite a few of the pictures from Sundry. Uh, my daughter uh, attended the University of Lethbridge back in 2008, and a job opening come opened here where, um, for a, a superintendent of Southern Alberta. So I played on that position and uh, spent the next almost 10 years here um, doing that job and retired here in uh, Lethbridge in 2019. We recently learned that my uh, great-grandfather was a gameskeeper in England. And uh, it was very interesting because some people say that it must run in my blood. Uh, but uh, it was very interesting. It's my great-grandfather, Thomas Morell, is pictured down there. I want to read out, we, my wife does a lot of genealogy and found a lot of this information. And, and with the help of um, one of our uh, cousins in England, we found a newspaper article about one of his cases. And I'm just going to read it because it's too small to read from there. So the, the newspaper article is titled, An Old Poacher's Request. John Marriott and Fred Smith were summoned for trespassing in pursuit of game in the occupation of Mr. Garfoot's at Mansfield on August the 1st, 1901. Thomas Morell, who was my great-grandfather, having given evidence Marriott, who had been convicted 41 times, was fined 30 shillings or a month in jail. Marriott replied, when I have done my time, I would like my ferret back. The ferrets were used to uh, put them down rabbit holes and chase the rabbits out, and then these uh, individuals would shoot the rabbits as they come out. Game warden Morell remarked, the ferret was left in the hole and hasn't been seen since. So this fine, in today's fine, was equivalent to $525. Also, just when I started writing my book, my dear friend Derek Trotter uh, presented me with a book that he had had for many, many years, and it's The Game Laws of England. And when I started reading through it, as you can tell, the pages are brittle and old. This book is from 1736. So it's, it, it's interesting that they had game laws back there and they described on the, um, on the laws, it, the preface it states in there, and it's very similar to what we use nowadays. Ignorance of the law excuseth no man. So our laws, laws are still based on that where the courts say ignorance of the law is no excuse. The book goes on to explain that what the powers of game wardens were back then, and it's almost like 300 years later we're using something very similar here. In 1906, Alberta got its first game warden, and, and here's a picture of, a, of an old-time game warden given a, a ticket to a, a poacher out by Hardesty, Alberta. And through the years, through, the, through my 38 years as a game warden, we've had a lot of different changes in our outfit. So as soon as we get a different political party in, we have some different priorities. We, we changed uh, agencies probably 20 times in my career of 38 years. Everything from energy and natural resources to forestry to fish and wildlife. A lot of changes have happened over, the, over that amount of years. What's interesting when I first got on was that in 1981, the population was about half of what Alberta is right now, and yet in 1981 we had more officers than we have today. Real quickly, what we do is kind of based on three different priorities, resource law enforcement, problem wildlife, and public education and outreach. Uh, resource law enforcement is quite uh, self-explanatory, but a lot of people think all we go, do is go out and check, you know, little old guys uh, fishing in the stream to see if they have a license and stuff. It's way more complicated than that. Um, over the years, I was part of the major investigations team, uh, the surveillance team, um, where we dealt and uh, investigated high-profile poachers within the province of Alberta. And we've had many, we had one case where 
One group had shot and killed over 100 moose, where they were selling it to individuals and restaurants in northern Alberta. We had, a, we had a case where five Mexican doctors had come up to Alberta and their goal with the outfitter was to illegally hunt and kill five grizzly bears. And grizzly bears are protected and, and highly illegal, so it, there, there's a lot of commercial activity. So some, some people say to me, well, taking an extra bird or an extra fish isn't going to harm the resource. But actually, if you multiply that by a hundred or a thousand, and everybody does that, it's going to harm the resource. So, so we're we're hired to protect the laws that are put in place by bi biologists on populations and and quotas. Problem wildlife probably encompasses half our time, where we deal with problems like bear and garbage, bear maulings, uh, cougar fatalities, cougars killing llamas and sheep and wolves. So currently with our lower staff levels, not a lot is done where, you know, somebody will phone in about a skunk in their backyard. We don't do that anymore. Just more where there's a public safety concern or uh, property damage, like uh, cougars killing a llama. Public education and uh, outreach and safety is a big priority also. So we, with our specialized equipment, we uh, partake in a lot of search and rescues. Uh, for instance, I was involved in High River in both years where they flooded, where we'd take our jet boats out and patrol the streets and uh, pluck individuals off of roofs that were stranded in, uh, in, uh, in High River in the vicinity. So, so public education is a big thing and public safety. After I retired, uh, a good friend of mine said, geez, you've been telling me stories for 35 years. Why don't you write a book about uh, you know, some of your different stories? And, and when we were on our cruise to, on the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, I started reminiscing about some of the different stories and decided that I was going to write a book about some of my adventures um, that had happened over the 38 years as a game warden. This particular one, I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about two today if we, if we have time, and uh, it involved uh, a problem bear up in a look at lookout tower west of Sundry by, uh, it's called Blue Hill Lookout Tower, and uh, this lady, the um, lookout tower lady, Sharon was her name, started having problems with a bear coming in, and there she was by herself up in the tower with no form of defense and the bear started coming in and one night broke into her cabin. She was able to escape out of the cabin and you see the tower in the background behind the Blue Hill Tower sign. She climbed that ladder and she spent the night in that tower sleeping. She got a hold of us the next day and we come out with the trap to try and catch the bear. We were part of the Rotary Club in Olds at the time and we had an exchange student from Brazil. Um, her name was Faye. And, and Faye's on the left there. We set the trap and uh, the next morning we got an excited call from Sharon saying that we in fact had caught the bear that day. And so I loaded up Faye and my daughter and my wife in the truck and we went up to show her what a, what a black bear was like. She had never seen one and that was on her bucket list uh, coming to Canada from Brazil. I opened the little door on the side and the little door is meant to tranquilize bears. And uh, when I did that, the bear stuck his head out the, the little door. And so she got some good pictures and, uh, and I kind of got the bear back into the trap and, and locked it at the bottom. We took it to a remote location where we were uh, getting rid of the bear and uh, she wanted one more picture before we released it. So I opened the door again, which is 12 inches by nine inches. So a pretty small opening. This bear was about 200 pounds. Again, he stuck his head out the door like on the top part of the slide. And before we knew it, he had slipped his body out through there, almost like a mouse going through a little hole, and was stuck. We got him up there stuck. And I had three women with me and myself. And the bear was stuck for probably 15 minutes. And I'm trying to decide what to do, and I decided probably I'm going to have to shoot the bear and cut it in half to get it off out of the trap. And how am I going to do that in front of Faye and my daughter, Caitlin, and Joy? So, 
Anyways, uh, I think it was my wife that had the great idea of opening the back door and we went and stuffed a bunch of logs in there and things so the bear could get a little bit of footing. And before we know it, it had flipped around and was getting out of the trap and uh, out. Well, we had everybody outside our truck and the girls were in the back box of the truck. So we got them into the truck and my daughter was quite a slim girl. She got through the back window of the truck all right, but Faye had a little bit wider hips and she got stuck in the window going in. <laughs> so here we got a stuck bear and a stuck exchange student. Uh, so we quickly pulled Faye back out. They got in the truck and uh, the bear got out and, and wandered off into the trees. So, so we had a lot of stories to tell. And uh, when I told our head office that we better send out a memo to get um, bars put across the, the, the cage so they can't get out the trap. They didn't believe me, so here's one of those things that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So it showed them step by step that in fact yeah, we did need some extra uh, bars on the top. This particular, uh, this particular case involved um, it, it, one of the sections in the book is notable enforcement cases, and, and we had lots of real notable enforcement cases over the years. As I explained earlier, we, we had a real poaching problem with people uh, shooting black bears and just taking the, the gallbladders for an aphrodisiac. We had everything possible, and, and they would make large amounts of money uh, doing this illegal trade. This, this case uh, involved um, a, a, an individual that we had got some information on, uh, uh, a guy, a, a sportsman, that had heard some information at work that it, there was, a, in fact, a guy at work that was going out and harvesting large numbers of whitetail bucks and, uh, and then just taking the heads for trophies. So with that information, we determined, or he, he advised us that this guy, in fact, was going out at night with a spotlight in his vehicle and then shooting the, the deer with a crossbow so nobody could hear the, the sound of a firearm at night. And he, known, he, had, uh, he had information at the time that he had shot at least five uh, big bucks and uh, had them hanging in his garage. So for the next, next couple nights, and it was right at the end of the hunting season, I kind of did some surveillance on his place and waited for him to come out at night, and he never did. On the very last day of the hunting season, we got some additional information that he was going out hunting with some friends with a rifle. So I got up early in the morning and kind of sat by his place and waited for him to come out of his uh, residence, which was on a farm up by Bowdoin, Alberta. When he come out, he was by himself, and I, I stopped him on a routine check just to check his licenses, and he had all his tags. His gun was unloaded, but when I checked the box of his truck, he had some blood in the back of his truck. And I asked him about the blood, and he said, no, it's just coyote blood. He had shot a coyote. Further examination showed that, in fact, there was deer hair in the back of the truck, and he denied shooting any deer at all. So his, his truck was put under seizure, and uh, till we could get some tests on the blood and hair to determine, you know, what, it, uh, what he had killed. With that information and his truck being seized, he said, you know, it was a work truck and he couldn't have it seized and he would tell me everything that had happened. So he went on to confess to shooting a large number of deer. And when we went and got a search warrant for his barn, we found four or five big deer along with a big bull elk that he had shot. And in the fields where he had uh, killed a lot of them, we found another two or three deer that he had shot and the deer weren't big enough. So anyways, he, he went to court and uh, he was fined, uh, I think this one was about $4,500 for this and, and he got a five year hunting suspension. So it, word really got around the community and, and deterrence is a, is a big thing. There's so many, you know, hunters out there, but so few game wardens. So when somebody does do something that's really blatant, it's we try to get it out in the media. And, and we got lots of phone calls afterwards telling us about all the nefarious things he was doing over the years. But uh, anyways, it was, it was one of the good cases. 
So, like I said earlier, we, uh, after I retired and a friend of mine was talking to me about uh, writing a book, I decided to start jotting down a few stories of cases that I had. And over the next five years, I compiled some of these stories. And somebody asked me how long it took me to write my book. And I said, well, it's 43 years. I said, 38 years of research and then five years to write it. So anyways, in, in my book, Alberta Game Warden Behind the Badge of 172, um, there I have eight different chapters with 34 different stories. Um, nine lives of this officer, some of the close calls I had during my career, and uh, a couple of them involving ICE, like in that first slide that we talked about. Notable enforcement cases, surrogate and decoy operations, stupid criminals of my career, adventures with bears, family wildlife encounters, humor in uniform, and then I was also part of the Guard of Honor, and, and I was really privileged to uh, attend some different uh, policemen's funerals, and I represented our Fish and Wildlife Division uh, with the Fallen Four in Marathorpe after that, uh, after that incident. I've had quite a number of highlights and uh, a few lowlights, uh, as you can tell by the, the slide on the right-hand side. And, and uh, after checking a, a hunter on a real slippery road going down the mountain, uh, my truck just got away on the road and, and it kind of <laughs> ended up on top of the roof. So anyways, uh, through, through the years, I was, I was able to um, uh, experience some very, uh, very key highlights of me. I was part of the G8 summit team to uh, when the presidents come to Kananaskis. Um, I was chosen in 2007 as Officer of the Year for North America, and uh, some different shooting events where we competed uh, the Fish and Wildlife Team in the World Police Games and the World uh, International Police Games, where where we were quite successful in the in the shooting competitions. This this sign here, King George. Is is the motto that I used for my whole career. Um, and what it says is, the late King George the, the VI said, the wildlife today is not, not ours to dispose of as we please. We have it in trust. We must account for it to those that come after. This is, this is a plaque I actually, every single office that I was uh, stationed in, this was hung in a prominent dis, uh, place where I could read it every day. And, and that was my... my um, goal when I went out on patrol for all those years is to protect the wildlife for the younger generations that come after us. So as my dad had taught me the love of wildlife, we wanted to make sure that our kids and our grandkids could also enjoy the, the um, wildlife and the fishers that, uh, that come after. And the, the last, last thing I want to say is, um, and I'm going to read it out here. Over my career, I've been very fortunate and experienced many unique adventures. Caitlin and my wife, Joy, on this book even wrote a story in there. My wife was quite a practical joker, and she wrote a, a story, humor in uniform, about a, a prank uh, over April Fools. And she took quite delight uh, in that story. I hope you have enjoyed a brief glimpse into my journey of 38 years as a game warden. I have experienced many things. The best part is the of the job was the people I worked with on a daily basis and the resource users. Many of these people became good friends. People make this job. 95% of the public I worked with and checked were law-abiding citizens and sportsmen who wanted the same thing as I did. A natural resource like a grizzly bear with their three cubs munching on flowers in the ditch, young wobble-legged fawns taking their first step, 
or the sound of geese heading south for the winter as you step outside. And I experienced that last night in the dark going out to hear the, see the full moon and then the geese going and stuff. It just sends shivers down my spine. These are all things that we can do and share with our kids and grandkids. And as I say this, please have a thought, what is special for you guys? Again, in, in leaving and finishing off, so I'm done in the, in the 30 minutes, is again, the late King the George VI said, the wildlife of today is not ours to dispose of as we please. We have it in trust, and we must account for those that come after. Thank you very much, and a special, pardon? Oh, you want, I guess we got five minutes. We had put a little blooper in the back here, and like I said, part of it, and it's not really part of the talk, but it's uh, part of our thing in one of the slides I said was public education. And uh, we were asked to go out to the Tim Hortons children's camp in this blooper and uh, have a, a bear uh, bear safety talk with them and the proper use of uh, bear spray and these 50 or 60 students had come from all over the world and most of them didn't even know what a bear was and they were hiking and and uh, recreating right in Kananaskis country so this is just a little 30 second uh, blooper about the bear spray training gone wrong we used inert bear spray so it's bear spray canister but filled with pressurized water instead of the the pepper spray. Yeah. <laughs> and watch the bear yeah. spray as she sprayed it in the ground and in the air and <laughs> 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 Yeah, we'd, we'd spent about four hours training them on how to use the bear spray and what to do and what not to do. And, and then when they got into a scenario type training, it all went out, uh, yeah, all their, all their training. So we had our work cut out for the afternoon retraining them again. But anyways, that's, that's my presentation. And uh, um, please, if anybody is interested in a book afterwards, we're gonna have some books here or we, the books are available at Analog Books, or you can get them on Amazon. So uh, thank you very much for, to SACPA for uh, uh, asking me to attend today, and a special thanks to Christy and Knute and Gord for the, for the introduction today. So. We're going to have a question and answer now. I'd ask those who are going to ask a question to line up here on my left. And uh, uh, we'll ask you to state your name, your questions briefly. No preludes or long stories, please. And of course, we expect respectful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your suggestion and pass it to me, I'd be happy to read it for you. Questions? Stand all on, the, on that little pad there, then people can make eye contact you and still face the... Okay, okay, okay. perfect. Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Thanks very much, Tim, very interesting presentation. Uh, my question relates to the supposedly upcoming hunt by the public of, to shoot problem bears. How, how do you feel about that, the proposal by the Alberta government that the public get out there and shoot the pop problem bears? Well, it's a very, obviously a very contentious issue um, with the announcement. It, when I heard about it, and the same way you guys heard about it on the TV, I was really shocked to, to hear that, and I, tried to figure out how they were gonna do it. And a little bit later, I, I found out, I believe the information that I got is they put kind of a, a, a 
quota draw out and then you would apply for that uh, particular opportunity to shoot a problem bear. And I think somebody yesterday at their talk said there were 7,000 people that applied. So I, I, I've been in a situation many times with, with dangerous grizzly bears and with even the amount of experience that I had, it's a very dramatic experience where I, if you have a bear charging you and uh, to, to be able to shoot it accurately is is very tough. So I have some real concerns over this, where <clears throat> first of all, if they don't make a clean shot, then they're gonna have an injured bear that's gonna uh, affect the public. There's gonna be a public safety. And plus it's gonna put the officer in jeopardy going after that, at, uh, after that wounded bear. And so when we, would, when we were responsible for putting down the wounded bears before, we would actually take DNA samples. So we could take a, a DNA sample off, for instance, a person that was mauled. In the, in the bite marks, we would collect saliva samples, take them up to Edmonton, a quick turnaround, they would tell that if it was the same bear that we had trapped and we were 100% sure, and then if that bear, if it was decided to be destroyed, then we could do it knowing that we had got the right offending bear. The way it's set up right now, I don't know how they're gonna do that, whether they're gonna go out and say, Jesus, bear's killing cattle out by Pincher Creek, and they go out there. If they do see a bear and shoot it, and we don't know if that is gonna be the exact bear that caused the problems before, so. So I, I can see some real problems with the way they're doing it, and, and being that I'm retired now, I'm not uh, up on the fine details how they're gonna do it, but I can guarantee if there's 7,000 7, people that have applied on it, you know, there's probably some good shots in there, but 99% of them aren't gonna be great shots and it's gonna cause problems with wounded bears and, and, and safety issues. So, so from my perspective, um, I don't agree with it and I can't see how it's gonna be successful without their issues. Bev Mundell Atherstone. Thank you, Jim. I've really enjoyed your talk. And, and I also heard you yesterday. And I wonder if you would tell again your story about the grizzly bear who was beheaded. Oh, geez. That was gonna be, that was gonna be one of my stories, but you told me that you didn't want to hear the story again. <laughs> so I changed it. <laughs> so. There's only three people here that were here. Today. Yeah, okay. So. Wow, I don't even know if I have time for that because it takes like five minutes, but uh, if, if I do have time, and it, it, it was a, I don't even have it on the slide here now, I changed it for this talk, but there it's, the slide shows uh, a grizzly bear that's beheaded and, um, and the public outcry worldwide over this situation. And, and uh, it happened actually on um, the May long weekend and out in the West Country and it had been like a really rough weekend where we had had two girls that had died from carbon monoxide poisoning in a horse trailer that we were the first ones upon uh, and a big grad party where girls were standing, girls and, and boy grade twelvers were standing around a fire and somebody threw a bucket of gas on them and the girls got burnt really bad and anyways it was it was a long bad weekend and, and Monday afternoon come and most people had headed back home and I decided that I was going to go and check some uh, anglers along the upper Red Deer River when I arrived at my my spot I noticed four horsemen on the other side of the river um, coming across and as they crossed the river I recognized one of the guys as a friend of mine that was an outfitter guide from the area and uh, as he crossed I greeted Ed and and uh, asked him what they were up to and he said oh we were just out in a trail ride and they were heading back and talked to him for a bit but he was a, he was a bit anxious to get going and and as he left he said oh stop by for coffee another day, Jim. And, and as he left, I looked down on the rocks and there was some blood on the rocks, on the river rocks. 
And so I asked Ed just to hold up for a sec. His horse had been injured, you know, crossing the river, and he said, oh, he'd fix it when he got back home. But, but it didn't seem right. There was quite a bit of blood. And as I walked up to him, I noticed a gunny sack uh, hanging from the horn of his saddle. And the gunny sack was dripping blood onto the ground. And, and I asked Ed what was in the gunny sack, and he had said, Jim, I was going to ask you tomorrow just to say, you know, to see what the proper procedure was. We, we ran into a grizzly bear that had been shot by somebody last fall, and I just took the head off to uh, take it as a souvenir. So it, nothing added up with it because it was fresh blood and something that had been dead that long wouldn't bleed as much as it did. <clears throat> so. Uh, I asked Ed to take me back to the location where he'd found the bear, and he refused to do it and said that he couldn't find the location. So the, the head was seized, and when we looked into it, the head was in there along with uh, 10 grizzly bear claws. And uh, so we, we, got, we went back the next day, and uh, we were able to backtrack where the horses had went, probably like five or eight kilometers. And along the, along the Red Deer River, we found a bunch of ravens in the trees. And below it, we found the carcass of the beheaded grizzly bear. So there was a big carcass there with the head taken off and the front claws of, of both pads taken off. And when we felt the bear, it was still warm. So with their big hide and stuff, you know, it retains their heat a lot longer. So, so we know that, that they had shot the bear that particular day. So we, we took samples from the head that we found and DNA samples from the carcass and then the claws, and we took them up to our forensic lab in Edmonton, it's, which is a really renowned forensic lab in all of North America. And they determined that the head and the claws had come from that, from that dead carcass. So we went back again to, to Ed to, to confront him with this information. And he had indicated that uh, he had talked to his lawyer. And his, the lawyer said not to say anything to us. So we, we searched the area more for a firearm because we we went into the carcass and with a metal detector and we actually found the wound channel through the shoulder into the body cavity of the bear and we dug out a bullet that had you know probably killed the bear. So with the DNA and everything, we went back to Ed and uh, and again he said he wasn't saying anything. So we laid charges uh, against him for a number of different things, close season hunting and uh, wastage of, you know, a hide and the legal possession. Because there was four of them and we didn't know which one had shot the bear, actually. And they must have seen me just before because there was an empty rifle scabbard on the, on the saddle of the horse and they must have thrown the gun away and, and probably picked it up later that night after I'd left. Anyways, we, uh, they pled not guilty, and on the trial date day, we had uh, RCMP forensics for the firearm. We had our own forensics people. We had, you know, myself, the investigating officer, and another um, officer that had helped out with it, ready to proceed with trial. And when, they, when the defense lawyer seen all our witnesses and what we had and what we were going to testify to in court, they changed their plea to guilty. And, and he received a, a lifetime suspension for hunting. And I think it was around, uh, I think it was a little over $10,000 in fines. But, but it, the, the case had received a lot of notoriety throughout the world. I, for like two weeks, I did telephone interviews with uh, newspapers from you know England and and all over and so there was quite a public outcry for what he had did and we had we actually had members of his church that had phoned me and told me that he would never do such a thing and and that we had people that had phoned and actually threatening death threats against him so it was a real convoluted uh, big case but in a real quicker nutshell, that was the, the case that you were talking about. Yep. Klaus Jericho. Uh, Jim, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, you said you've been at it for 38 years. And uh, my question is, um, the state of wildlife 
in Alberta, Fish and Wildlife, uh, at, at when, you, when you started, the, uh, the population has decreased, uh, has doubled in that time, but the number of wardens has not increased. So now my question is, what is the state of wildlife, fish and wildlife in Alberta today? <coughs> That's a great question, and and I, and I believe our our where we are at with our uh, populations is very good right now. It's very healthy. We all we I think we talked yesterday about lots of deer in backyards. So so we know our our deer populations are healthy. Our grizzly bear populations had declined drastically over the years, and and we, we used to have a hunting season on them probably like 15 plus years ago. When the biologists determined that the numbers were going down, they stopped the grizzly bear hunt, and with that, numbers started to gradually increase. So we, we, see, we see more geese, we see more ducks. I believe our, our um, populations are, are very healthy right now. We, and, 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 that, and I think it goes to good management of these species uh, in having proper hunting seasons, having some protection on them. Because when I, when I said earlier we went to Vietnam, you go to Vietnam and uh, you don't see any wildlife at all. Everything that's there is shot and killed. The fish, when, and, we, and we've dealt with it over the years where we get some individuals that come from some of the countries where fishing isn't a sport, it's a livelihood for them. They fish to catch fish to live. So when they come here and the, the notion of having catch and release uh, for a trout is absolutely unheard of in their culture. Why would we go and fish to catch a fish and then put it back in the water? So it was a huge educational uh, opportunity that we had. We put out newspaper articles in their different, uh, uh, different community um, newspapers. We held meetings like this to try and explain why these laws are in place. So, so to answer your question more, I, I think right now the stocks are, are in really good shape. And, and we still get certain certain people that'll take advantage and take over their limits and stuff. But like I said earlier on my talk, a good 95% of people are law-abiding citizens and they respect the laws. So uh, some places it's not the same, but in Canada, especially Alberta, we do have uh, a very healthy population where wildlife is respected and, and laws are followed generally. My name is Graham Greenley. Jim, I was just wondering uh, if you have very many regrets about your 38-year career. <laughs> you know what? That's, that's a very interesting question, and I have absolutely zero regrets. Uh, I, I loved my career. Like any, any job, you have your up and down days. There's certain times when we had different political parties where they felt wildlife enforcement, fish and wildlife wasn't a priority. And we had times where we were sent to parks. We had times where they wanted us to concentrate on water resource issues, not fish and wildlife. So we, so we did have some up and down times in, our, in, in my career. But uh, as far as regrets, I, I love the job. I, you know, we, we provided a living for our family. My section in the book where it's called Wildlife and Family, my, my kids had such an opportunity to experience, like I got slides of them with cougar kittens and that we took to the zoo and ducklings in the bathtubs. And I, like I say, I have so many fond memories of my job that, that absolutely zero regrets. I'm Ian Hurdle, and I got to say thanks two days in a row. <laughs> so I actually have two questions. One is about bear spray and its usefulness. I know sometimes when it gets left on the packs after it's been used, bears actually like to choose, chew on the packs, so maybe comments there. And then about the grizzly populations, because I know up around Pincher Creek, 
by collecting the DNA hair. I think she's, the researchers got up to 281 individuals, so maybe comments on those. I can't, I can't comment on the 281 number, but I know the staff that actually did those studies, and there was a, a large amount of grizzly bears in the area. And, and, there, and there has been, and, and I think they're looking into it, but the, the biologists now, like I said, we, we canceled hunting of grizzly bears, and right now the grizzly bear density in Pincher Creek is probably the highest in the whole province. So I know before I left that there were some serious discussions about instituting a, a limited entry hunt again for grizzly bears, where like before we might have had like five in the province, five draws. And, uh, and we definitely, over the years that I even got to Lethbridge here, we've seen the, the populations increase. And, and with that, we got, you know, we had more cattle killed, we had, you know, different situations. So, so a lot more of our time was being spent with, uh, with grizzly bears in, uh, in that area. And, and not just that area, Claire's home. We, like, this south of Lethbridge, and just south of McGrath, we had grizzly bears. We had a grizzly bear in the golf course last year. So they're expanding their home ranges where we used to see them occasionally in the mountains, where now we get quite a few of them, and then they're dispersing out into the prairies. And that's where they were originally from years and years ago, is they were a, they were a prairie animal. So, so I, I hadn't heard that number, or if I had, it didn't stay in my head about the 281, which seems like it would be pretty high, but that what's really interesting with the hair and stuff, that's unique to every bear, so they can take DNA, so, and they would put up these barbed wire things and then and do studies, so they did that for quite a number of years, but, and getting, and to the bear spray issue, bear spray is extremely important, and I just went on a hike last week myself, and I made sure that I had my bear spray on, and it's readily accessible. It's, they've, we've done studies with bears in traps to see the effect on them, and, uh, and bear spray is extremely uh, beneficial. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Mary Shillington, uh, thanks Jim for your uh, talk today. Uh, as I look at the the cover of your book, which is on a TV table at our house, <laughs> and I've read I've read a, a number of the uh, um, uh, stories and and impressed with you know sometimes how dangerous some of the things you've had to do. So uh, if anybody is interested in in reading his book, please. Purchase it and, and read it because it's well worth reading. So thank you for thank it. You. That was the easiest question I had to answer all afternoon. <laughs> uh, my name is Doug Neal. And seeing as we came from the bush in Manitoba, I can tell you that my wife is a lawbreaker. Um, <clears throat> We did a dangerous thing. Um, we lived in the bush. We had bears in our yard and foxes and coyotes and stuff. And my wife took a course on uh, rehabilitating birds. And we come home one day and there's a, uh, a fairly large bird in the. Uh, it was it was in the in the yard, and it had flown into. A, the clothesline and had a broken wing. So we phoned the game warden and they said, there's a hefty fine if you do anything with that bird. Can't take it in the house. Uh, you're supposed to leave it for a snack for a fox. Um, <clears throat> and my wife didn't want to do that, so she took it in and she used that course she had, fixed the wing and you couldn't let it go with a broken wing. We kept it, I think we, and then it got a 30 below in Manitoba. We kept it in that house for about six or eight months. And our ceiling was 25 feet high, so we had three dogs and a, and a cat, 
in the house, and that bird flew around, and they were buddies. Uh, and we released it when the weather was good. So did we do a dangerous thing? Or we should go to jail for that? He said, there's a, there's a hefty fine for that. <laughs> We have, we have rehabilitators in Alberta here, so if that would have happened in Alberta, we would have said, you know what, we, we have a group of people that actually, volunteers that go out and collect birds like that, and then we take them to a, an actual re rehabilitation place where they can do it. We don't encourage just general members of the public to do it. But we wouldn't say, like you were told, that just to leave it for fox food and stuff. So we don't, we're like everybody else, we don't like to see animals suffer. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, here we would get them, and I've taken, my family and I have taken hundreds of birds to the rehabilitation center where they, or the experts, they work with vets, and they determine whether if the, the break is too bad, they might put it down, but if it can be re rehabilitated, they will, especially on birds of prey that you know, are more endangered. If it was a magpie or a crow, it'd no, probably be euthanized. No, so. it was a, <coughs> one of those winter birds, and it was a a lovely bird, and when we let it go, it hung around for a day or two, and then it disappeared. Then it disappeared. Yeah. Well, that happy ending for that bird. My wife told me the name of it. But when you get as old as I am, you can't remember anything. As long as I can remember where the kitchen table is, I'm happy. <laughs> but we did have bears in the house. Can I tell you a little story? <laughs> our, our Reed, and he, he liked to bake bread. And he was baking, he had four loaves of bread out rising on his uh, kitchen cupboard. And him and his wife decided to go for a nice walk. And they went out and they closed the kitchen door, just the, the screen door. And when they come back, there's a nice big black bear in the kitchen having a feast on this bread. <laughs> and they had one awful time getting this bear out of the house. But there's no way they were going to shoot any bear. And, but they got the bear out and the way they went. But they lost their bread. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Hi, my name's Karen Tui, and it um, sounds like you had a wonderful career. <laughs> um, I was wondering about avian flu. Do, I, I'm, a few years ago, there was so many, um, what do you call them? The ducks and geese. Not the geese, yeah. dead on the river, frozen to the ground. Do you, can you tell us anything about, are their numbers way lower, or have they recovered, or do you know anything about that? Well. They, yeah, they, they're they very healthy, the the geese, and, and I, I found some myself when we were going there with the birds with the avian flu. So it happens every year to a certain percentage of them, and, and it seems to happen more in the winter months when instead of flying south, they kind of congregate in smaller areas of, and they keep a little area open for, uh, for them swimming and stuff. So as far as, and, Biologists look after the stuff and all the techniques with avian flu. Our, our role at that time was to go and pick them up and then we would take them to our lab and then they were testing them to see if in fact that's what they were dying from and then they would take them and incinerate them. So we, there, there was times that, you know, when I was working we had an outbreak quite a few years ago that my half ton truck it was filled right to the box, right to the brim with a, with a tarp over it, and we delivered them to Edmonton for testing. So, so there is, when they get into a situation like that, thousands of them die, but it really hasn't affected their populations too much. They're, they, like I say, we, we probably have more geese now than we've ever seen in our, you know, in our history. Peterson again. One more question uh, for you, Jim. Uh, you says you told us that the 
wildlife population is in pretty good shape right now, but I think there are some issues with the uh, fish in the in the creeks and the Grosnes Pass area and other places uh, threatened by maybe some coal development and those kind of things. Uh, are the fish population in, in really good shape? So like you said, Knut, the wildlife populations are in really good shape. We're seeing lower numbers of hunters out, but it's almost the opposite with, with fishers. And uh, so we have large, huge increases in the amount of people that fish, and they fish the crow's nest and, uh, you know, the Bow River. And every year they've had to put more and more restrictions on them because there's so many people. And even though it's catch and release in a lot of places, you still get the mortality, a hook mortality, where they're not handled properly and, and they end up dying. So, so unfortunately, I can't say that the um, native populations of fish are as in good shape. We, we have a, a huge stocking program in Alberta for walleye and uh, some rainbow trout and stock ponds which is, they're designed to be kind of put and take, where you put them in and then the recreational fishermen take them out, but our, our native cutthroats out there and, and the different breeds of trout are in serious trouble. And, and they, you know, and whether, you know, I, I don't know the ins and outs with the, with the coal exploration, but we, we have a cabin in Montana by Lake Cucanuso, and, and we see there's lots of controversy about the tech mines and all the, the sediment that's flowing into the river there, which eventually goes into Lake Cucanuso and then into the United States into the Kootenai River. So that, what's it, selenium, I think that they're talking about. So, so it's, so I don't have firsthand knowledge of that. I, I know what I read, probably the same as you. So, but, but I do know that, you know, the populations are, are down considerably. We have time for one more question. Uh, my name is James Phelan. I'm from Lethbridge Polytechnic, and um, it's my great privilege to to have the final question. But first and foremost, Jim, uh, on behalf of the Polytechnic, we're so incredibly proud of, of your contributions to the conservation program too. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge Joanne's contributions as our um, Director of Advancement during her time uh, at Lethbridge College and now Lethbridge Polytechnic. Um, Jim, I understand you might have had some hand to play in a rather famous mount in our Hubbard taxidermy collection. Uh, for those of you who haven't gone through the collection, there's a very noticeable bear mount that has a uh, very large black bear that is on its back uh, with a very, very large grizzly bear getting ready to de devour it. And uh, I've heard some conflicting stories about um, how this, how this uh, mount came to the collection. Um, I'm curious whether you, you could uh, provide some insights on that. Yeah, I have first-hand uh, knowledge on that particular mount. I'm the one that secured it for the college to get in there. And uh, when we had seen the rivalry between the pronghorns and the, and the college and stuff, we, had, uh, we wanted to get a bear for there, but that's just a joke. But anyways, that, that bear, the background of it, it was, and that, that mount probably would have cost Thirty or forty thousand dollars to get mounted, and uh, uh, a poacher actually went up into uh, Alaska and uh, illegally shot that bear. They shot it over bait, and they shot it during a closed season, and they did a host of things wrong. But what had happened was they illegally, after killing it illegally in Alaska, they brought it into Alberta. They imported it into Alberta. So right there is an act, it's an inter-country act, it's called the Lacey Act, that if you shoot something illegal in one country and it's deemed illegal and you bring it into Canada, then it's deemed to be, to be illegal here. It's, it's not a case of if it's illegal there and you happen to get into Canada, it's all right. It, it doesn't happen that way. So, so the, uh, 
there was a large uh, um, uh, major investigation uh, investigation on that, and it involved not just that one grizzly bear, but numerous grizzly bears. But as a result, that one was seized by the time the investigation was done, and it was forfeited during the court proceedings, along with like extremely hefty fines. So, so um, a circular went out and said does anybody know who might be able to benefit from this mount? And they were looking at museums. And, and then I put a kind of a proposal in that it would look really good in the Hubbard collection for the, for the college. And, and they decided that's where it was going to go. So we, the college actually, I think, paid for a big truck. It's a massive big mount uh, there. And uh, we were able to secure it for the college. So, so that's, that's kind of the, the background on that. Yeah. Perfect. But well, thanks for uh, for uh, saying that. I kind of forgot about that one. Before I turn the microphone over to Jim for the final word, I'd just like to mention that next week's presentation here will be Jason Foster. He's the director of the Parkland Institute. He's a professor of HR at the University of Athabasca, and his talk will, topic will be Method in the Madness, is chaos used to advance the Alberta government agenda. He also has a presentation at the university on Wednesday the 23rd at 7.30 in room M1040. Huh? Seven o'clock. Markham Hall. And now, thank you very much for your talk today, Jim, and w may I ask you to give us a final takeaway message for the day? I think I kind of said that right at the end of my talk, but it, the, the resources belong to everybody in the province, and it's not just fish and wildlife officers or biologists that are responsible for that resource. We all are responsible for it. So, so that's probably my takeaway is, uh, like my plaque said, you know, it's, it's ours and we want to protect it for future generations. So that's, yeah.